Flora Stone Mather was a very bright, a very caring, a very dedicated woman who was light years ahead of her time and truly had vision for the future. She had a stature and but a generosity of spirit which allowed her to excel as a leader and yet be very humble and very personable and very comfortable to be with. Well, Flora Stone Mather was obviously the greatest woman in Cleveland's history so far. An ideal of 19th century womanhood and a prototype of America's progressive period, Flora Stone Mather supported nearly every philanthropic cause and was personally active in the fields of education and social welfare. Her contributions to Cleveland's social, cultural, and civic affairs led to the creation of many of the city's most valuable and enduring institutions and justified the accolade, the most memorable Cleveland woman of her era. Located at 514 Euclid Avenue, Cleveland's Millionaire's Row, stood the residents of Amasa and Julia Gleason Stone. They had come here from Springfield, Massachusetts in 1850 with their two young children, Adelbert and Clara. Here on April 6, 1852, Flora Amelia, their younger daughter, was born. Amasa Stone made a fortune in bridge building, railroads, and banking. Amasa and Julia Stone were parishioners of the First Presbyterian Old Stone Church on Cleveland's Public Square. Clara and Flora belonged to the Young Ladies Mission Society. The pastor of the church, Reverend William Henry Goodrich, was an important influence on the children. Goodrich died in 1874 and was succeeded by the Reverend Hiram C. Hayden, who from that same pulpit offered direction and counsel for his parishioner, Flora Stone. Another important influence was a teacher, Linda Thayer Guilford. At the Cleveland Academy, Clara and Flora received the equivalent of a rigorous high school college preparatory course. Pupils were inculcated with the value of education, a sense of moral responsibility for the poor, and a missionary spirit. An expression of the Guilford philosophy was the Young Ladies' Temperance League. Flora was an eager recruit. From her earliest years, Flora Amelia Stone was described as a frail child whose lack of strength was offset by an abundant enthusiasm, coupled with a fine mind and good judgment. At Linda Guilford's Cleveland Academy, she had many friends who often urged, wait until Flora comes. She will know just how to go ahead. The Young Ladies Temperance League expanded upon its original goal to assist working girls to find jobs and lodgings. The young women established reading rooms and provided literature espousing Christian ideals. For working mothers and their children, they started a day nursery program where, for five cents a day, youngsters received food, clothing, and medical attention. Flora's commitment to the League was one of active, personal involvement. I rushed over to the league and had such a sweet time at the nursery. The nurse went to her tea and left me alone with the babies. I sat by the fire rocking a cradle and singing to a tired little boy. Then the mothers came for their children and I had a little talk with each one. We want to have them feel that we take an interest in them and their children, for one object is to do them all the good we can. Three doors west of the Stone Mansion at 383 Euclid Avenue was the home of Samuel Livingston Mather and his wife, Georgiana Pomeroy Wilson. A pioneer in the development of the iron ore industry, Mather organized the Cleveland Iron Mining Company in 1847 to utilize the iron ore deposits of the Great Lakes region. On July 13, 1851, their first son, Samuel Mather, was born. Death, disease, and injury, a more common occurrence in the 19th century that preceded today's modern medicine, played a role in shaping young Samuel Mather's life. Following the birth of Sister Catherine, their mother died from tuberculosis. Samuel was only two years old. In 1869, young Samuel's plan to enter Harvard ended when he suffered an accident while working for his father's Cleveland Iron Mining Company that left him with a permanently impaired left arm. 
In 1856, his father, Samuel Livingston Mather, married Elizabeth Lucy Gwynne, and they had one son, William Gwynne Mather. On January 14, 1880, Samuel Mather wrote to Flora, I love your conscientious devotion to duty. I love your untiring energy and cheerfulness of spirit. As I think of these things in you that I love, I fail to see what there can be found in me to excite a responsive feeling in your heart. And yet I must trust and hope that you may find, or think you find, something there. On August 10, 1880, Flora Stone responded, What touched me most and made me most glad of you was that you said we would try together to live naturally, truthfully, humbly striving to improve ourselves and to be of some honest use. On October 19, 1881, Flora Stone and Samuel Mather were married, and following a European honeymoon, they lived with her parents. Two years later, Samuel Mather helped found Pickens Mather and Company to sell iron ore and coal. The company became one of the largest shippers of iron ore from the Great Lakes region. Pickens Mather also operated coal mines and blast furnaces throughout the Midwest. Flora continued her allegiance to her own Presbyterian church and also went regularly with Samuel to his Episcopal Old Trinity. They had four children, Samuel Livingston, Amasa Stone, Constance, and Philip Richard. In 1881, with Amasa Stone's help, Western Reserve College moved from Hudson to Cleveland, and it was named Adelbert College after his son, who drowned while at Yale. In 1883, tormented by blame for a railroad tragedy, physically ill, and grieving over the loss of his son, Amasa Stone took command for the last time and ended his own life. Flora became the dispensing hand of a large inheritance about which she felt a duty to distribute in a way her father would have wished. In 1907, Flora Stone Mather wrote to Western Reserve University President Charles Franklin Twing, if acceptable to you and to the trustees of Adelbert College, Mrs. Hay and I wish to build on the campus a chapel to be called the Amasa Stone Memorial. Our father had a strong conviction of the value of biblical instruction and of church services. He believed pure religion to be the only sure foundation for the individual or for the community life. And so it seems fitting that a chapel bearing his name should be placed on the campus of the college in which he was so deeply interested. When Flora Stone and Samuel Mather married, a philanthropic partnership emerged strongly influenced by the tradition and patterns of giving established within the Stone household. At their church in 1863, Amasa and Julia Gleason Stone helped establish the Home for Friendless Strangers to provide assistance for refugees of the Civil War. After the war, the need continued for medical care of Cleveland's poor. And in 1866, a house was bought at 83 Wilson Street, which was operated by the Cleveland City Hospital Society. This marked the origins of University Hospitals of Cleveland. In 1884, at the age of 33, Samuel Mather became a trustee of Cleveland City Hospital. Two years later, he began his tenure on the Board of Trustees of Western Reserve University, continuing the tradition of support initiated by the Stone family. Samuel Mather served both institutions faithfully and generously until his death in 1931. The quality and character of Flora Stone Mather's efforts as a philanthropist reminded many of a ministry. She explained, I feel so strongly that I am one of God's stewards. Large means without effort of mine have been put into my hands and I must use them as I know my heavenly father would have me and as my dear earthly father would have me, were he here. In a family tradition of financial support started by her father, Flora made her first large gift to Adelbert College in 1888 to endow its first chair in the name of Hiram C. Hayden, her pastor at Old Stone Church and president of Western Reserve University. She would later give Hayden Hall to meet the growing college's needs for dormitories and classrooms. When the College for Women was created in 1888 as the coordinate to Adelbert College for Men, Flora's mother, Julia Gleason Stone, and brother-in-law, John Hay, married to Sister Clara, 
were among the first donors. Flora gave and worked generously on behalf of the College for Women, which one day would bear her name. In 1892, she built the first residence hall and named it in honor of Linda Guilford, her teacher at the Cleveland Academy. When at least twice or perhaps three times a week the door of Guilford House opened to admit Mrs. Mather, any girl who chanced to be near the door impulsively stepped forward to look with level eyes into her bright and expressive ones. She seldom came empty-handed. It might be flowers, not thrust forward or laid down indifferently, but presented graciously with, I thought these would look well on the mantel or on the table in the Guilford drawing room. She would personally take an interest in the students at the college and go up and visit them, meet them in their dorm, sit with them with meals, but would never um, take the seat of honor. She wanted to be part of them. And they were very uh, mindful and appreciative that she was very busy, that she had uh, many other interests, and, and that she also had a household of four children at home that she was managing. In many ways, I consider Flora Stone Mather the mother of much of Western Reserve University and therefore what we have now is Case Western Reserve University. The part of the university campus which ha housed the Floristone Mather College uh, is in many ways, I think, the prettiest part of the campus. Uh, and I think the buildings on it are a uh, testament, really, to Floristone Mather as a philanthropist. Every student that comes as an undergraduate to this university goes through buildings that are on the Floristone Mather campus. They reflect back on a rather glorious past of the university and I think look forward to an equally glorious, maybe even more glorious future. Responsive to the problems arising from industrialization and acting on her feminist convictions of advocacy for women and children, Flora became the first president of the Cleveland Day Nursery and Free Kindergarten Association, of the Young Ladies Branch of the Women's Christian Association. In 1886, Flora solicited and received the support of Cleveland millionaire John D. Rockefeller. This has been our most successful year, at least so far as the Perkins Nursery is concerned. That is the largest and best appointed in every way, and through the summer we had as many as 38 children some days. Even in the winter weather, when the women have less opportunity for obtaining work by the day, we have had as many as 27 and 8 children a day, all we can manage with our present arrangements. If she could see in Hannah Perkins what they're doing today, giving them that kind of care, and also of carrying out Flora Stone's other idea, which was that they must get to know the families and see what the conditions in the families were and how it affected the children. In 1897, Flora Stone Mather founded the Goodrich Settlement in conjunction with the Old Stone Church and named it to honor the pastor of her girlhood, William Henry Goodrich. She donated the original building, paid the settlement's expenses during its early years, and established its first endowment fund. We have been able to affect a lot of people's lives during that century of service. And we hope, as we move into our second century of service, that we can truly continue the work that Flora Stone Mather was so committed to providing. In 1905, in response to the need for more space, Flora Stone Mather organized the effort to relocate Hathaway Brown School to a new location on East 97th Street. She donated the land for the new school, while her husband Samuel gave money toward its construction. The Mather tradition of support for Hathaway Brown has continued through four generations, advancing the school's motto, we learn not for school, but for life. The idea that we always focus on is the, the civic responsibility, being good citizens in the community, and learning so that one can serve others is more important than just book learning and taking tests and succeeding on academic uh, credentials. So I'm very proud that HB will continue that tradition, which I see as being the ideals that Flora Stone Mather shared and inculcated throughout her life. In 1890, the Mathers built a suburban retreat on the shores of Lake Erie called Shoreby. A close friend recalled Flora's love for this place. 
Who that has stood with her at Shoreby among the pink dogwood trees in their rosy bloom and seen her delight in them and in the lovely laburnum blossoms could help seeing, besides her pleasure in nature itself, her realization of it as an inspiration and a bond of friendship. I like the entrance to Shoreby, the spring wildflowers that used to be in the old entrance. The drive was beautifully natural without being manicured, and I'm sure it appealed to the fact I was a, a young person and you felt at home there. It was a place where kids could play in the stream and all kinds of fun activities occurred. Underneath the facade of Puritan solemnity that I think many people viewed Samuel and Flora Stone Mather as having, there was a lot of joy in their life. On August 8, 1908, Flora wrote her sister, Clara Stone Hay, describing the events leading up to an operation for breast cancer. Last January, I showed Dr. Cushing a little brown mole that had appeared on my breast and had it removed, a trifling matter. Two months ago, I thought there was a little knotting of muscle, or perhaps better to say, a little lump in the breast. Dr. Cushing saw nothing to indicate trouble. I went back to see him Tuesday and things seemed so serious. They agreed that something should be done at once. Dr. Cushing and Dr. Kreil said that they hoped an operation would be a cure. Less than five months later, surrounded by her family, Flora succumbed at Shoreby. Following the funeral service at Old Stone Church, the procession moved slowly east on Euclid Avenue to Lakeview Cemetery. A graduate of the class of 1894 reported, at last, when the end came to that active and useful life, the students of this college stood in line on the sidewalk as the funeral cars passed by. I came to Cleveland that day and stood there too, because it seemed that here, near the campus in which she had showed such interest and to which she had given so much, was the place in which to say that last goodbye. Tragically, Flora never lived in the grand home that she helped plan. Completed in 1910, located on Millionaire's Row, the Mather Mansion still stands, a testament to standards of excellence, thoroughness, and attention to detail. These qualities were reflected throughout the lives of Flora and Samuel Mather, so it is little wonder they would be so elegantly interpreted in their homes. In the 25 years before her death in 1909 at age 56, Flora Stone Mather achieved a remarkable record for philanthropy. In her will, she stipulated that Lakeside Hospital, where she had endowed the training school for nurses that carried her name, continue to receive annual gifts. When the medical center moved to University Circle, Samuel Mather built a dormitory for nurses and named it for his late wife. Continuing Flora Stone Mather's support for the College for Women of Western Reserve University, Samuel Mather, their children, family, friends, and alumni, created in 1912 the Flora Stone Mather Memorial Building, the Mather House Dormitory, and the Mather Gymnasium. Flora Stone Mather provided for Goodrich House, a settlement house that spawned an array of social agencies, including the Society for the Blind, Cleveland Music School Settlement, the Consumers League, and Legal Aid Society. Her will also listed bequests to over 30 religious, educational, and charitable institutions here and abroad. In an ultimate accolade for 1909, a Cleveland leader editorial eulogized, Mrs. Mather achieved a career of which any man might well be proud. In 1910, upon receipt of the memorial volume prepared by Samuel Mather for his wife, John D. Rockefeller wrote, her beautiful life and works were always an inspiration to us as well as to so many others. Her memory will be ever dear to the multitudes she blessed. There is no one to take her place in the city she loved. Flora Stone Mather had a very deep sense of the responsibility of people who had the potential for leadership to make a difference in their community. 
And she clearly made a difference in the community in terms of social services, in terms of medical care, and in terms of education. The university is the legacy of her commitment to education and the way that university hospitals is to her commitment to medical care and the way that a whole range of Cleveland institutions are to her commitment to social service. She focused on the biggest problems of the time. She taught every member of the family that there's joy in that. This is a family feeling that one's resources have been given from generation to generation and the stewardship of that family ability to help others is a sense that we continue to want to give to the community. A woman of extraordinary accomplishments, Flora Stone Mather, a model of her time and station, demonstrated firm personal convictions in the implementation of her good works. One of the pleasant results of giving what we can during one's life is that we can see ourselves some of the good results. But don't forget that I'm a steward in a double sense. I give what I've not toiled for, I've not earned, and I want to give it as I think my father would wish me to.